now. All right, take it away, Federica. All right, thank you. Can you hear me? And can you see a slide deck? She's yep. gonna turn into yep. full screen mode in a second. All right, yeah, so very unpretentious title <laughs> beyond the stars. Um, thank you for the introduction. I missed the half of it because my headphones weren't plugged in. So I might repeat some of the things that you said. Um, but no, I think I heard you saying that I have an unusual affiliation right now. I'm at the University of Delaware and I'm both uh, faculty at the Department of Physics and Astronomy as well as uh, um, at the Joe Biden School of Public Policy and Administration. Um, and I was hired through the Data Science Institute, which is a new institute on the University of Delaware. Um, so instead of giving a regular talk about the science that I and my research group do, I thought I would share with you some thoughts about, um, that I think about a lot, about why and how um, should I get involved in things that I'm going to generally talk about in this context as public policy, but that really are just thought, just ways of using my data training, my scientific training for problems that have direct impact on society. Um, I have sort of a, I have a lot of slides and I don't think I can cover them all. And I have sort of a um, plan about what to talk about, but the fact that um, the plan is not entirely um, well set and that this is the first time that I give this kind of talk, I think is an opportunity. So if there are any things that are particularly interesting that you wanna pause on and talk about more, I very much encourage you to interrupt me and uh, make this as much of a discussion as possible. Uh, so my general plan is to talk about what I've learned as an astrophysicist, particularly what I've learned that is applicable to, um, to using my skills for public policy and for the greater good. Um, I will talk about um, image-based urban science. This is uh, the topic in public policy that is, close, that is close, most closely related to my astrophysics training. And that's the work we, that we do at the um, Urban Observatory. I will talk about a specific project, which is a project where we got involved with um, the state of Delaware and the Delaware hospitals in responding to the COVID crisis. And I chose to talk about this in some more detail because there was a lot of controversy about involvement of scientists in the COVID crisis and what is the right way to do that and what are the benefits of it and what are the potential, um, the potential side effects. And then if we have time, I have a lot of thoughts uh, more recently about general topics of data ethics um, and ethics of AI. And I would like to share some of them and particularly I would like to share how, why it is important that the people that work on the technical side of data science do get involved in these discussions that are typically held at the philosophy and uh, policy level. So that's the plan. So I'm definitely an astrophysicist by training. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in astronomy. My graduate degree is in physics. And not only that, but I'm, I'm quite strictly an observational astrophysicist. I've worked with telescopes at the software um, building and um, observational design and data reduction level my entire career. Uh, this is a photo of me in grad school. Uh, we were creating the first multi-telescope, robotic multi-telescope network in Taiwan, the Taos, Taiwanese American Occultation Survey. And I sort of got plunged into this data science uh, type of uh, research on account of this project. So just very briefly, uh, it, the project was working extremely closely with the data. Uh, my deliverable for my PhD were scientific, so I was charged with constraining uh, the size distribution of Kuiper belt objects uh, be beyond what the observational size, what the limit of the, of the direct observation is in size. So we cannot see Kuiper belt objects that are smaller than 
roughly 100 kilometers, even with powerful telescopes, maybe a little less now. Um, but we can have indirect evidence of their presence, particularly I was working on occultation, so we see them passing in front of background stars. Um, except that these events are very rare, um, they are very low signal to noise ratio, and there's a lot of complications that I won't go through. But at the end of the day, the relevant thing is that the images that we, we devised, a, a, a new observational, a new way to observe um, with the telescope by keeping the shutter open, which turns stars as you see on the left of this diagram, into streaks, which is what you see in the center of the diagram. And so the intensity of these streaks varies with time, and that's what we measure. And we do photometry on this kind of images as opposed to this kind of images, which meant entirely writing all the, all the data reduction pipelines from scratch, which of course I didn't do entirely by myself. Uh, there were a few grad students, several scientists and postdocs, etc. Uh, so another important thing about this is that the time scales for these observations were sub-second, and you will see um, in a minute when that become relevant, becomes relevant. Uh, but I did work in a variety of other sort of more traditional um, observing methods as well, and different, with different science scopes. I worked on time scales, sub-second time scales. In fact, those time scales are even a little bit further to the left um, when I was working on occultations. Um, this diagram is generally the way in which uh, time domain scientists like to represent the, um, the phase space of time domain astronomy. So we have characteristic time scales on the x-axis and peak and um, characteristic magnitudes on the y-axis. And you can populate it with different objects. And there's an interesting story about how this diagram gets populated over time. Um, this particular plot actually comes from a Rubin paper from um, the, uh, the uh, from the Jelko uh, Yevesich 2019 version of the Rubin of the Rubin of the Rubin analysis team paper. So I've also worked in supernovae, so on these time scales of roughly months, um, and you know you really work on time scale, the time scales that often are relevant are a little bit shorter because you're interested in specific phenomena inside of a time series that evolves on scales of months or maybe days. And I've also worked on longer lasting transients like LBBs and um, eruptive variables that can last as long as decades. And this is sort of the framework with which I got involved with the Rubin Observatory. And so you might, I might, we might know each other from uh, the fact that I've been quite involved in the science collaborations in the past um, several years. But uh, my point is uh, that I wanted to tell you what my background is because I want to start with thinking about which ones of those things are important for me and helpful to me when I try to do things that are not astronomy. Um, so there's a few things that I think are characteristic of the training uh, of an astronomer, and we don't often discuss them. And I think we should discuss them a lot more. And we should particularly let students that uh, are training in astrophysics department know that these are all skills that they're learning. Um, because these skills are extremely valuable in any um, in any job that has any sort, any flavor of data analytics um, or problem solving. So problem solving and abstract thinking is something that we naturally sort of acquire from doing projects and trying to um, extract in, and trying to understand the mechanisms from their, um, from how they appear through the data. Uh, obviously, we deal a lot with data as astrophysicists, and we deal with the data that we have. In many cases, we are unable, in the lifetime at least of a PhD, to um, create data sets that are any better than the ones that are already available. And in some cases, we're able to create them in the lifetime of the PhD, but not really to analyze them in depth. So I think I, at least I grew to be quite adept to working with the data that I have, and at the same time thinking about how the data should be better and how I may be able to do it better on longer time scales, um, but I'm not yet. So kind of like um, the way Noam Chomsky would say that you had to deal with the data that you have and not with the data that you would like to have. 
Um, I've done a lot of coding in grad school. I became quite proficient in a few languages. Right now I use Python as my preferred language, but back then I also used Fortran, C++, and C. I got used to talking about complex concepts but with a caveat that I got used to talk about in the, about these concepts to scientists. So two people that generally speaking had the same background of problem solving and abstract thinking. Uh, if I get to talk about what the difference is between talking about these, com these concepts, these kind of concepts to scientists and to non-scientists, that is an interesting discussion, I think. And then a really important skill that you might or might not acquire in astrophysics training, uh, but more often than now you do acquire in modern astrophysics is working in a large collaboration. Um, and that is actually quite unique to physics and astrophysics compared to other scientific disciplines. Per perhaps not unique, but more common in physics and astrophysics than in other scientific disciplines. And it turns out it's a really useful skill because I wholeheartedly think that if we do get involved in um, using our skills for, um, for any, uh, any topic of study that has um, direct applications and therefore that has concrete consequences, we must do it in collaborations with experts. So um, fast forward a few years after a couple of postdocs, I um, started working at the NYU Center for Urban Science and Progress. Um, this opportunity was, I thought that this was a great opportunity because it gave me the opportunity to work directly on a very um, impactful problems. I also want to be entirely honest and disclose that we really fell into it. And we, in this case, is myself and my husband, Greg Dobler, we fell into it to solve the two body problem. I was at NYU with a postdoc in astrophysics and we were looking for, and we were before that both postdocs at UC Santa Barbara. And uh, when Greg's postdoc ended a year after mine, we were looking for opportunities to live in the same city again. And, uh, and this was one of the opportunities that arose for him first, and then I joined a year later. Um, so the NYU Center for Urban Science and Progress was a new facility of um, New York University uh, that was aspiring to um, essentially study what we call urban science. Uh, one of the catchphrases about the center was that the center is where big cities meet big data. So exploit um, the big data revolution to improve um, life in cities. That's kind of the idea. Another, um, you will see in this slide and other slides, we always talk about turning, using cities as laboratories to help um, city living. And we sort of stood on the, on the shoulders of giants because this idea that we can study cities in a way that is, well, first of all, let me point out, the center is extremely interdisciplinary um, and, it, and it's, that it's so by design. So there were people from a variety of backgrounds. There are people that work um, in health, um, people that work in economics, people that work in sociology, uh, there's engineers, computer scientists, and yes, there were um, several, in fact, physicists and astrophysicists. Uh, and we sort of stood on the shoulders of giants because the concept of urban science, so the concept of having scientists and mathematicians study urban environments um, precedes us. Particularly, there is a really relevant, um, a really relevant set of papers um, by um, Jeff West, his name right here, and Bettencourt and also Jeff West and other collaborators. And there's a TED talk by Jeff West that is really interesting that became quite famous where they looked at city phenomena from a very strictly mathematical, in a very strictly mathematical framework. And they found that there are very many uh, scaling laws of cities that apply to city all over the globe and that are quite strictly following um, the same slope. So 
For example, the way in which crime grows with uh, population in a city, the way in which GDP grows with population in the city, the way in which income grows, and also particularly interesting perhaps, they have this metric of creativity as the number of patents that come out of an environment, and that also scales with um, with the um, population size and with a specific index. Uh, if I, I heard somebody I'm muting, if there is a question, I'd be happy to take it otherwise. I'm gonna carry on. So there's a whole discussion about the interpretation of this that from West was the city works like networks and networks have these scaling laws. The same thing happens with biological networks because it's a matter of distribution of resources, etc. But I'm not going to dwell on that too much. Um, instead, I'm going to bring up a series of tweets by Patrick Sharkey, who is a sociologist at Columbia. He focuses on racial disparities um, in urban environments, broadly speaking. And he was talking about this, um, about the fact that he watched the talk by Jeff West and discussed it with their students, with the students in his class, and brought up some interesting points um, about the concept. And one of them, um, so all the tweets are interesting. Um, and I have great respect for Patrick Sharkey. Uh, one of the point is, uh, I would argue that this law misses the point growth itself and the distribution of resources, people, diseases, crime, etc., are crucial phenomena that urbanists care about. Um, West takes the growth for granted, but do some city grow, why do some city grow and other don't? Um, and so he goes on to discuss how um, you study this growth to act upon the city from a policy point of view. I think that this is a good example of what a scientist can bring to the table of a discussion of a sociology, of a, street, of a uh, primarily sociological problem. Essentially what he's saying is that um, Jeff West approximated the city to a spherical cow. And he found that to be um, problematic in the context of this study. And I would argue that uh, while it might very well be, uh, I think it is uh, I, what I'm gonna try and argue for the rest of the time that I have is that um, while it may be problematic, it actually offers an opportunity um, to look at the same problem from multiple points of view and put together those points of view to, to find more creative solutions. So things that I had not learned in my training that came up all the times when I was, when I'm working on, that come up all the time when I'm working on um, sociology and policy and urban problems. The noise is never Gaussian. Uh, in physics, we just love to approximate it as Gaussian. That approximation just really makes no, it makes no sense a lot of times in physics, but it really makes no sense um, when you talk about people primarily. And not only that, but your data are strictly bias dominated. This is something that if you're a cosmologist, um, makes a lot of sense. And if you're, an if you're a person that designs surveys, perhaps make a lot of sense. And you think a lot about how do you remove the bias in your surveys. Um, but it, the problem is uh, absolutely much more predominant in urban data when you deal with data um, about people. Um, another, crucial point is that useful overrides interesting when you talk about probably about um, topics that have an impact so while in astrophysics I have the luxury of sort of following a lead because I find the problem interesting that would not work when I'm working on problems that are impactful of course I don't have any of the domain knowledge that I need to interpret correctly the analysis of urban data or sociological data of any kind and uh, talking about complex concepts to people that are not scientists is a whole different beast, especially considering that those people are generally not interested in the technical aspects like a scientist would be. And then the last thing that I thought a lot about as a consequence of um, the work that I'm doing in policy is data ethics. What are the ethical implications of uh, collecting data, using data, um, and choosing and, and of the data analytic choices that you make. 
and hopefully I'll have more on that on that in the rest of the talk. Um, to give you a sense of what we do at the Urban Observatory, which again is the most closely related topic of urban science, um, most closely related to astrophysics. In astrophysics, we study the light. I particularly study time domain astronomy, so I study the change in light in stars and galaxies. At the Urban Observatory, we take images of the city and we study lights, of, and we study city lights. Um, there are, uh, this is, there is not completely unprecedented. There are satellite um, studies of urban lights, uh, but they're not resolved to the individual light. Um, so in that sense, um, this is a completely innovative methodology. Um, this is uh, Greg Dobler, who's also my husband, who is the director of the Center for Urban Science and Progress Urban Observatory, and now of the Multi-City Urban Observatory. So I just want to give him uh, the due credit. And again, um, at the Urban Observatory, we study persistent, we collect persistent and synoptic observations of cities in broadband, high spectral, from visible to infrared wavelengths, and that enables ecological, sociological, and economic studies. I'll give you a couple of examples of, of um, projects that we work on. Why don't I do that right now? Um, so one of the things that I got most involved on at the beginning was um, studies of energy. Um, on the right-hand side, if it plays again, which I'm not sure, I'm gonna play it again. You have the flickering of a light bulb. Uh, I got involved in this project when I first got to the UO, to the Urban Observatory, because this project works with very short timescales. And so, do, so did my, uh, my um, outer solar system studies. So the light that was flickering was flickering at 120 Hertz. So obviously that is a frequency that you don't see with your eyes. Um, it is, however, potentially detectable. And if you can detect it, uh, then you can learn a lot about energy consumption. You can learn at the individual premises, so at the individual light bulb, what is the load um, that that circuit, that, that, um, that unit has on the system and how is the load changing over time. So in other words, um, in, when you uh, turn on and off appliances that has an imprint, imprint on this frequency because the phase of the frequency changes as the load changes. Um, and why is that interesting? Not because we want to know how you use your electricity. I want to point out that we are extremely serious about privacy. We don't study individual units, in fact. Um, and, and there is, in fact, no interest in knowing how much load is on an individual unit. But what you want to do with this is study the grid and study the stability of the grid. The stability of a grid is of an electrical grid is a tremendous issue in um, in urban um, in urban environments. Uh, obviously, um, literally lives depend on the electricity being available on avoiding blackouts, and there is a, an, an enormous focus on that and an enormous investment in urban environments. Uh, but the, the complexity of the grid, which arises from the fact that the grid was really designed uh, at the beginning of the electricity distribution uh, and wasn't designed for cities that grow at the pace at which they've been growing and they're growing now, uh, makes it extremely complicated to understand the grid, even for the, um, the companies that are distributing the power. So what we're trying to do is look at the dynamics of city lights to understand the load on um, the load on the grid and the stress on the grid. And uh, when you have significant blackouts, large area blackouts, um, those blackouts are preceded by variation in the frequency of um, in this 120 hertz frequency, which comes which comes from the 60 year frequency of the alternating currents coming in. So what we want to do is build a robust, um, a robust um, observational network that can monitor the frequency and understand if changes of frequency are simply phase changes that are due to change in the load, or they are actual problems of the grid, which would enable preventing blackouts. Um, This is done, actually, let me go back to this slide. 
This is done already in a lot of cities at the level of measuring each individual unit, uh, measuring the amount of current that is being used by a unit, by an individual household or an individual building. But smart metering like that is extremely expensive. Um, even New York City, who's a very advanced um, technologically advanced uh, city that has a very large budget is just now getting to that. So if you ever lived in New York City and you got an electrical bill, that electrical bill was essentially a fantasy. Nobody has measured how much electricity you used. Electricity was measured at the large unit level, so at the level of building unit or even multiple buildings, and then scaled by the um, area of your apartment and by the time of the day. Um, and whether or not you had activity at peak time. The cost of smart metering is enormous, whereas what we envisioned was to be able to provide a technology that is extremely cheap. The first, uh, the first implementation of this technology used um, these kind of cameras. Uh, I'm not gonna go into much detail, but we used um, a liquid crystal shutter. So it was a little bit more complicated, but the total cost of the equipment was only about $2,500. And then we figured out that we were, we were being a little bit dumb and we could actually just do it with a single camera. The reason why we needed the shutter is because the frequency is 120 Hertz, but we wanted to take longer exposures than that because at 120 Hertz, we wouldn't see most of the city lights. So we created a beat frequency with the 120 Hertz mains we monitor that and any phase change in the original frequency would also show up as a phase change in this slower frequency that allowed us to um, expose for longer and therefore capture more faint lights. I got a couple of animations here. So this is the frequency of the grid that we can see in our with our very cheap equipment um, at CT scales. Here you have a close up of one of the lights that was producing the most clean signal. Of course, not all of the lights had clean signals. Some of them had barely any signal at all. But this is not an uncommon problem for an astrophysicist. We were working at the edge of the signal to noise ratio with fairly traditional astrophysical techniques of aperture photometry, maybe adaptive aperture, um, maybe segmentation for figuring out what were the actual sources. But all of these for an astronomer was fairly standard and traditional um, techniques. At the bottom, by the way, you have a power spectrum that shows that you do see the frequency that you expected. And the slight shift from the frequency that you expected is not an instrumental effect. It is in fact a slight shift from the target 120 Hertz frequency um, that can change by um, a few Hertz over time. And that's the grid stability that I was talking about. We can also look at the structure of the grid because we can, we can if you know anything about electrical grid, this might be interesting, otherwise it might be a moot point. But we can also look at the ABC phase of um, the distribution network, which allows us to understand what blocks of the CT relate, uh, are linked to the same trans, um, transmis, transmitters. And this is really significant because that data is generally not public and not available at all to any entity, including not available between um, energy um, providers that may be competing. So just briefly, another project that is particularly dear to my heart. Actually, let me go back one second. Um, I forgot to put a slide about this in here, but I wanted to put a slide um, of one of, the one of the cities outside of the US. All this work was based on New York City because we were in New York City and, um, and our data was collected there. Uh, but think about the transferability of this work. Think of, in New York City, you know, they are making an investment to measure um, the electrical grid uh, consumption and to measure the stability of the electrical grid at the sound of $1.5 billion over 10 years, fine. Uh, but they do have the resources to do that. Uh, think about the transferability of this plan and think about the possibility of bringing it to a developing country that would not have $1.5 billion to, um, to spend on this kind of, on, on smart metering of the grid. Um, 
this is a methodology that can collect data uh, in from in a, a whole city at once. So you're not biasing towards metering only the wealthy area of the city and abandoning the less wealthy areas of the city. Um, and it is extremely inexpensive. So the investment here from the point of view of city governance is really just in the setup and the data analytics. So it's only an investment of uh, really uh, hiring people that can do the data analytics um, or and, and providing the infrastructure for doing that. One of the um, governments that we're working with is the government of Sierra Leone. Uh, Sierra Leone has an extremely progressive government with a significant investment in um, in technological progress um, and, um, a, and, and especially for improving quality of life. Um, it came from, um, it arose from a, um, a civil war somewhat recently and um, an extremely forward thinking and progressive government has established data and we made contact with them and we're considering uh, deploying an urban observatory in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Of course, there are um, ethical implications to this, particularly when you think about deploying technology to developing countries that come from a political crisis and you have to wonder about uh, the potential um, for um, government stability and the potential implications of this work. And we think about that a lot and I'm happy to talk about that as well. So another quick, um, another quick um, topic, we work on um, ecology of cities. 75% um, of greenhouse gases in New York City come from building emissions. This is something that is sometimes called the building metabolism. Um, this is extremely hard to um, regulate from the policy point of view. And it's extremely hard to know what building and what building are producing uh, the plumes and I just want to point that we actually don't do policing with this data so we wouldn't tell which building is producing more harm, more green more um, um, more pollution but what we would could do is identify areas of the cities that are more subject to this to help city governance deploy resources effectively so we approach this from a machine learning point of view, real and artificial intelligence point of view, and uh, a, a bunch of great students at the, at the Center for Urban Science and Progress developed a platform that automatically detects city plumes and can measure them and build a census of New York City's, uh, on New York City city plumes. Uh, we actually do that in difference imaging. So if you are a time domain astronomer that works closely to the images, this um, is familiar to you. So we subtract the uh, science image from a template and, and everything that is uh, not changing goes away. So all the buildings go away and everything that is changing stays. So we actually detect, we actually only see the plumes in this image roughly. And, um, and there's a lot of details and contamination with a bunch of other things, including clouds. Um, but that's another story. Uh, by the way, this approach is what I'm also applying to astrophysics in the detection of uh, light echoes that look very similar to plumes in that they are um, time varying, low signal to noise ratio extended um, sources. I'm gonna pause and ask you if you have any questions about this work before I get into the COVID um, the COVID collaboration that we have ongoing. I'm gonna go on. So as the COVID crisis um, developed, um, I think you might have seen, heard, read a lot of controversy about whether or not it was appropriate for physicists to get involved in um, COVID-related data analytics. Um, in full disclosure, I did get involved in COVID-related data analytics, as I will discuss in a second. Uh, but I do hear those comments, and I do think that there is a lot of value in that discussion and in those comments. Uh, one of the uh, sort of poster 
children for this problem was um, the study that was done at the University of Illinois. This is an XKCD, um, that, one of the many uh, comics um, that came out from that from that experience. Uh, what happened was that this group in Illinois had developed a predictive model for COVID and they had underestimated the social interaction that students would have as they returned to school in the fall, therefore underestimating the spread of the virus um, quite significantly. And the joke is that they were physicists, so of course they would underestimate social activity and party because they're physicists. Um, there's also this, which I think was a really um, entertaining take, which is that we were all spending a lot of time at the beginning of the COVID crisis looking at exponential charts. And the, ex the amount of time that you were spending looking at exponential star charts was itself growing exponentially. But this, I think, is, brings a really important point. This XKCD comic was trivia to understand for a physicist. And it was way, way above most people's, uh, most of the rest of the audience had. Uh, as astrophysicists, we do understand exponential growth very well. And I think a lot of the issues that we see with the spread of COVID arise from people not understanding exponential growth. People feel a false sense of safety when they see few cases and they don't understand that going from two to 10 cases rapidly is extremely problematic because they, all they see is like, Two is not so different from 10. And they don't understand the concept of exponential growth intuitively enough to understand how scary that prospect is. And I think that um, scientists have not generally done a great job communicating that. However, um, astrophysicists do not really understand how science translates into policy. So there was a lot of miscommunication about the predictions that were being made. Um, about the predictions that were being made. Uh, this is a discussion about that very topic and that very prediction by the University of Illinois and physicists that was describing exactly this. They came up with the model, they made predictions. Then in the model, they claimed that there was a worst case scenario that they were using. They were essentially, this person argued, sorry, I don't have the citation here. I'll fix it in the slide. Um, this is just a blog. Um, they, the model has neglected to you to clearly um, and accurately describe human interaction. So essentially they are saying these physicists treated people like spherical cows. And therefore they um, underestimated social interaction and underpredicted the number of cases. What they forgot is that this was exactly the model that the University of Illinois, that had convinced the University of Illinois to close down in March at the beginning of the crisis in the first place. So they've no, they have, um, they, they understood that their, that their underestimate was problematic, but they didn't give them credit for actually being able to quickly model and predict the rise of cases in the first place. So what I wanna argue is that certainly you don't wanna go the route of an opportunistic paper on COVID because it gives you the possibility of writing a quick um, publication that is kind of fun for you as a scientist, but that there is actually a tremendous need of involvement and a tremendous space for involvement. So the first thing that I think one should do is wonder is ask if there is a need. And um, a part of the discussion that has not been clearly addressed is that in general, there is a gross overestimation of the resources available to research, for research, to hospitals and urban environments. Um, of course, I'm not talking about urban environments like New York or Seattle or Chicago that probably do have teams of data analysts and researchers and epidemiologists, but for the rest of the country, that is largely not the case. And I will show you the case of Delaware in a second. Also, another significant issue that people fail to appreciate, let me rerun this so you see the animation, is that while every state has a surge problem, it has a surge plan for 
cases of crisis. What was missing until now in the US was a search plan that does not rely on mutual state aid. In other words, every state had an independent search plan that said, if we run out of hospital beds, or if we run out of uh, medical personnel, such that we are unable to actually take care of the rapidly growing number of patients. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to the neighboring state and ask them to help us, which obviously works if the crisis is localized, but does not work in a pandemic. So the time when I got involved in this, um, hospitals were in significant crisis because they not only didn't know whether they were gonna be able to have resources for the patients of the state, but also they were being asked to deploy resources and to, and to let other states use their resources. We are next to New Jersey and next to New York. So our hospitals were being asked to provide support to those areas. And they didn't know if they could because they didn't know if the following day they were gonna find themselves out of resources for the people inside of their own state. So the crisis was very significant. And in that crisis, uh, that it turns out, we found out, that of the five hospitals in Delaware, there is only one that has an epidemiological team of one person uh, who we've been working in close collaboration with. And they do not have computational resources. They have a very small software engineering team that, primarily, um, that is primarily made of um, one lead and a couple of interns. Um, or junior scientists. Uh, and this is uh, a small state, but uh, the, the hospital that I'm talking about is Christiana Care, which is a well-known hospital in the tri-state area that serves not only Delaware, um, but often serves the neighboring area, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and was recognized as a great care facility. So the first condition of needing help was fulfilled. And the second condition was if there were, for me to get involved, was if there were a team of domain experts that I could work with, because not having that would, actually, I think I had, no, never mind. Uh, not having that would put too much responsibility on me um, of doing things that frankly, I don't know how to do. I do, I'm not an epidemiologist. So this is our team. Um, again, Greg Dobler, my husband, Eric Best is our data guru, I'll mention him in a second. And these are the Christiana Care and DEMA. DEMA is the Delaware Emergency Management Agency. Think about FEMA, but at the state level, um, AJ Shaw, Mia Papas, and C. Chama are collaborators. So what they originally wanted help with was to use an existing um, software that was written in Python. Uh, that was enabling prediction of hospital capacity and hospital demand. Um, it was enabling it through a user interface, which is what you see at the right, which was accepting some um, input, uh, some input parameters. Um, but it was written in Python and they wanted to get more control because the input parameter that it was requiring were frankly not under control. Um, the in spite of the fact that there, is, there was significant criticism for physicists simplifying the epidemiological problem, uh, I want to disclose that in fact, epidemiologists, um, the, epidemi the standard epidemiological approach is very similar to a spherical cow. Um, typically, there are two families of models in epidemiology. One is the compartmentalized models. Um, the SIR, SEIR, etc. Essentially, the idea is that you have three populations. This can grow to be a few more uh, susceptible, infected, recovered, and that fractions of the population move exclusively from the left to the right in this diagram over time. So you begin with one infected person, and then you move a piece of the susceptible population into infected, infected into recover, etc. Um, so this essentially comes down to a set of three uh, first degree um, differential equations, which is quite familiar to many physicists and astrophysicists. And this is probably why a lot of physicists felt comfortable getting involved. Uh, the models do require some knowledge of um, data that is really domain 
there, it really relies on the domain experts. The double in time of the disease, the social distancing that modifies the double in time over time, the hospitalization rate is important because you only know the data that are coming out, but you don't know the really underlying infected population. And if you're thinking about resources at a hospital, definitely the hospital length of stay and things like that. And even this, the most physical parameters of the problem, for example, the double in time, was really hard to measure at the beginning. Um, this is a chart of the doubling time in the tri-state area, so near Delaware, uh, for Delaware, Maryland, New York, Pennsylvania. The straight lines are constant doubling time lines. Um, the, the thick and thin lines are state by state. The thick lines are the ones that I mentioned. And what is notable is the fact that the doubling time changes over time. So even putting it into an interface like this is pointless because the doubling time that you have now is definitely not going to be the form, the doubling time that you have tomorrow. So long story short, our first contribution was to just simply be able to run vast uh, suites of simulations where we were modifying all the parameters instead of running a single simulation with a single parameter. And this was huge. It's so simple for us that we, we got to it on the second day of our collaboration. And it was huge for the, for the local hospitals. We can make, we can then make predictions that had uncertainties and we could explain what the uncertainties were. Of course, the predictions were really shady at the beginning because we had very few data points. We got involved really at the beginning of the crisis when Delaware only had a few days of patients in the hospital. Then we could, we could uh, fit more data, et cetera, et cetera. We could look at residual, study periodicity, and things like that. That is really helpful to our hospital partners. These are not dissimilar to the predictions that you have seen probably for models like the IHME. However, we had complete control, so we could explain what the uncertainties was coming from. We could do that for local populations instead of doing it statewide. statewide. And we can do that with data that we had confidence in. Our um, data guru, Ari Best, worked extremely closely with the hospitals. There's a whole story about how you get access to this data and the kind of trust that you had to establish with your partners to do that. But he worked super closely with the hospitals to get data on a daily basis from them for both the people that were testing positive, the people that were being hospitalized, correcting the, the data that were coming in, um, that were being recorded at the state level in many, in many occasions. And then, of course, um, he still gets access to this data, even though uh, federal, um, federal mandates have restricted the publication of data. Then we got involved into, into creating more complex uh, models with the help of the one epidemiologist on our team, of course. And then the critical point was to be able to include population characteristics of the state into the model. This is something that unless they had people that were able to code the model independently, um, Delaware would have never been able to do that. And we know how sensitive this disease is to the age and every state has a different age distribution. So this is a crucial point. So where are, there, is, there are racial connotations, um, there's a significant disparity in the expected deaths and the expected hospitalization rate uh, for, different, um, for different ethnicities and race in different states. Um, and really you had to measure that at the state level to get a, to get a handle on this. Um, where are we now? We are modifying these SIR models. So the other family of models that you can intuitively realize people may wanna use is Monte Carlo simulation, agent-based models where every individual is essentially a particle with a profile and a probability of interaction and of contracting a disease. Um, this should be extremely familiar to a physicist, and it is, except it's computationally extremely intense. So we're talking about millions of particles in a very high dimensional space where the probabilities are oddly distributed. Uh, I'm going to cut uh, several slides now, and I guess I won't get to talk about data ethics. But so, so where we are now is that we are building an, a, a new model called DARMA, Delaware Health and Recovery Metric Analysis, where we essentially uh, created a hybrid um, in between uh, agent-based or Monte Carlo simulations and 
and compartmentalized models where we have uh, groups of people with um, specific characteristics, age block, ethnicity block, like a specific age bracket, ethnicity, socioeconomic, profiling comorbidities and a probability of interacting with another group. And we let this system evolve. Essentially, this comes down to being a very large sparse metric multiplication, which we can do by including all of the relevant specific parameters of the state. And then we throw it into an MCMC and get covariance of the parameters, which allows us uh, we hope to really understand intervention point and their success, model the policy changes, model the response to policy and the effect that that has on the distribution. The problem at this stage is the computational complexity still, even of this group, of this group based Monte Carlo simulation. Um, so we can right now do 100 by 100 subpopulation block, 100 subpopulation blocks that gives us a matrix of 100 by 100. So the computational cost is already rising. So the next step of this is to build an emulator around our simulations um, that can predict new, particularly new surges, uh, seasonal effects, and um, the implementation of and the effect of policy implementation. And just very quickly, so this is a testimony from the Delaware Hospital Partners. It was invaluable to have predictions for the next week instead of having to panic and act the about the next shift. This is the level at which local governments need help in a crisis. I'm also organizing a hackathon. I've organized a local one and I'm organizing um, a global one that is sponsored by the um, International Astronomical Union in January. So stay tuned where uh, the idea is to bring Monte Carlo simulation experts. So people that simulate billions of particles to study the evolution of the universe with epidemiologists to come up with efficient, um, efficient models and an efficient platform to simulate the local reality and the spread of the disease in the local reality. So I won't get to talk about any of that, but I do have a lot of thoughts about data ethics. Um, just briefly to say in which context I would have wanted to talk about it. Uh, there are two myths that um, are pretty much universally stated when talking about data ethics, which is that data science is a black box, by which people mean that machine learning is a black box, and that the models are neutral, but the data is biased. Um, I think both myths, if you work closely with models, can very easily be debunked. Um, models have various degrees of transparency. That transparency is a function of the complexity of the problem and the complexity of the data that they're able to handle. And also of time, we learn, uh, we in make improvements on the transparency of our models um, all the time. And, um, and if you are, a person that makes decisions about models, you should know very well in, that you have to make many decisions. Let me see if I can get those lines about your model. What is your model? What model are you going to select? Um, what is going to be the inherent transparency of that model versus the accuracy of that model? So there is already a choice at the model at the model selection point. You're going to have to choose a cost function, and this is more complex than it looks. Uh, what are you going to minimize? For example, in the case of prosecutorial justice, um, prosecutorial justice is one of the topics where machine learning has been used and significantly abused to perpetrate um, injustices. Um, and one of the issues is that it's not clear what is the thing, the target function. Are you going to try to maximize safety? minimize the number of people that are unjustly incarcerated, those two things are not the same. Um, and then um, the data is complex and I'm really out of time, so I'm gonna stop. All right, well, thank you very much, Federica. I'll encourage everyone to use the clap emoji or unmute if you would like to. Uh, and, um, I don't want to keep people too long, but I do want to see if there's uh, any questions uh, people want to raise now. Uh, looks like Andy has his hand up.
Thanks, Stefan. Um, so, Hello. so it's really hey, it was really nice talk. Um, I guess one of the one of the questions I have is when you're talking about uncertainty, and particularly in predictions for the models, and you're talking with people yeah. who are policymakers or you're talking with uh, with the hospitals. I mean, when you when you say that you've got uh, an uncertainty of 100 to 500 beds in terms of the prediction for the next month, that's a big um, difference in terms of how a hospital system can respond. How do you convey the the concepts of uncertainty to groups who may not um, have as uh, as much experience? Yeah, in it? yeah it's uh, it's an enormous problem, right? So. You know, that's the problem that 538 has been having in the last two election cycles. How do you convey the uncertainty in the prediction with the probability, with how much people actually like a candidate? That's exactly the same problem. So one thing that, is, that has become very clear is that the communication is very different. So we were making these plots with the uncertainty band and like maybe the three-folded uncertainty band for the one sigma, two sigma, three sigma, none of that lands. Uh, people that are boots on the ground policy, boots on the ground health system, they like tables. So our plots were pointless. They wanted numbers. And they wanted to know, but, uh, but then the other thing is that, so they wanted like a minimum and a maximum, which is atrocious for me because I can't tell you what the minimum and the maximum is, right? Because I can only tell you what my confidence interval is. Uh, so there was a lot of discussion about what we would deliver. Uh, but the other aspect is that for them, it's huge to have anything that, um, that e any kind of prediction. So even if we were super concerned about the fact that we have this huge uncertainty on a one month time scale that depend on so many parameters that we don't understand that on the evolution of the disease that especially at the beginning we had very little understanding of. They didn't care. They just wanted to know are we running out of bed tomorrow, out of beds tomorrow. And it was huge for them to have like and a, and a, a factor of three uncertainty over a one week time scale, because that allows them to literally not panic about the next shift. So in a sense, it was a matter of adjusting my expectation about my work and understand what, which, what of my work, like what of my work was actually useful and where was I wasting my time trying to um, improve things that didn't really need, that didn't, weren't really as impactful as they were in my head. I'm not sure that that entirely answers the question. No, that was great. That was really good. I mean, particularly the the uh, the short time scales versus the long projections. Yeah, but communicating uncertainty. I mean, that I spend a half of my when I teach in the public in the school of public policy. That's a half of the of the semester is spent on talking about what uncertainty means and what do we do with it. Uh, John, I saw you had your hand up next. Um, yes, one of, uh, so first of all, excellent talk. Thank you for sharing all of these different okay. approaches and things. Um, one of the things I was wondering throughout this was how do you get involved? Uh, I was, I took part in a, um, I don't remember if it was a one day or a weekend um, hackathon at NYU some years ago where I worked with some people on um, working with busing data and trying to oh, yeah. implement some bus tracking systems because they weren't available in New York at the time. Um, and I honestly actually don't even remember how I found that one. Um, it, uh, you know, it, it's clear that you have, you have the people you know who to, contact and such, but just randomly writing an agency and saying, hey, I'm a physicist, I'm here to help. So uh, it, I think it depends a lot on where you are, right? If you did that in New York, everybody would be like, who are you again? Where are you, what are you affiliated with? But literally this is how we got involved with um, the COVID project. Literally Eric Best, who was at the time affiliated with the Biden School of Public Policy and Administration, he got sent home like we all did picked up his kids and the way he says that I picked up my kid at nurse at um, kindergarten the their teacher told me I'll see you tomorrow I haven't seen her yet and I found myself with my working schedule completely changed so I sent an email to Dima and I was like is there anything that, I, that we can do as data analysts and they were literally begging for help 
And the bar was really low. At the time, they were like, do you know anybody who can code in Python? That was the entry level. That was like how much help they needed was they were looking for anybody that could code in Python because all of the people that were in their um, in the Christiana Care Center coded in R and the software that had been released as open source was Python. So other than that, um, there's a lot of civic engagement groups, Code for Philly, Data Kind, um, they, that organize hackathons very often or kind of uh, meetup and bar meetup groups. So I strongly recommend these groups. Code for Philly, Code for America is a great organization. Um, Data Kind has great activities as well. And there's more that I can't remember right now. And uh, JD. Hi, um, I'm wondering how much is done with um, kind of back testing the models, right? I know that this has been a kind of a common complaint with some yeah. of these things that if you went back and you took what they, you know, how well did they do? I'm kind of curious how that's actually played out in the project you've been doing in Delaware. So um, it's super important and it's super useful. And actually it's interesting because that is something that for a scientist is quite intuitive, is a quite intuitive test that you do. You do it all the time, right? We all do it all the time with our time series in astrophysics. It is quite a foreign concept. I remember that when I was at CUSP, um, there was a talk about predictive policing um, where somebody was uh, discussing how they had a model that was helping the police deploy forces. And if you know, if you um, or if you're on Twitter or on any social media, you know that this is an extremely controversial topic. And the simple question that some of us asked was like, "Well, did you back? Did you test it on historical data?" And he hadn't even um, that hadn't even wasn't even in, in their plan. It wasn't something that they were accustomed to, so they weren't thinking about that. Um, so we did, and uh, and you know the the issue is more. Um, so the, the epidemiological aspects are not that complicated; they really aren't. Um, the 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 aspects that become complicated are the intervention points. What is the impact of a particular policy intervention? What is the impact of having closed the schools? What is the even even to more detail? Um, Delaware has a um, significant rural area and it has a very significant poultry industry that is very industrial and that um, the workers are um, typically immigrants very very resources limited and there was an outbreak in the poultry farms and literally the intervention point was to go to the poultry farmers and tell them that they had to wear a mask and be more careful and that had a significant impact on the spread so obviously it's hard to even if you go back, it's hard to model them, but we can put the intervention points now in our time series and see the impact of those modeling them with a simple like logistic, um, logistic model. Thanks. Sure. All right, well, let's thank Federica again. And um, the uh, she'll also be taking meetings. It looks like the schedule is full, but if you're willing to partner up with people, uh, you know, I think small meetings of two or three people per time slot also works. So uh, check out the details on the Google document. And I'm also willing, like if anybody wants to talk to me later at some other time, of course, I'm super happy to do that. So just but, reach out. But yeah, uh, thanks again, Federica. And thanks for everyone for attending our first uh, virtual Dirac seminar of this academic year. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's an honor. <laughs> thanks, Federica.